All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our second women's wellness event of the year. Um, thank you so much for bearing with us as we switch this to a virtual event. I am told that there is a thunderstorm hovering right over Killingworth tonight. So in the um, interest of safety, um, we're glad um, for those of you who were able to come on virtually. And we do hope to see you in October for our final event of the year in person. And we'll tell you more about that later. Um, so I wanna uh, just thank our sponsors for tonight's event, uh, the Peach Pit Foundation, Liberty Bank, and Radiologic Associates of Middletown. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Women's Fund before I welcome our guest speaker. Uh, the Women's Wellness Fund was founded in 2014, and we advocate for, educate about, and fund priority women's health projects. And this is our steering committee from throughout the county. And I especially want to thank our members. Um, and I misspoke. The Women's Fund was uh, founded in 2017, four years ago. Um, and together, you have donated over $200,000 to women's health projects. Um, at the hospital and in our community. So we are so grateful to those of you um, who have supported us over the years. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what you funded. So this is last year's report, um, just as an update. Um, we uh, invested in an iPad screening tool at our outpatient center. Um, and this is to identify women at their mammogram appointment to see if they may be at a higher risk for cancer. And that's a tool that has been um, used in Middletown, as I said and it'll be rolled out at our other mammogram locations. We also funded the Center for Integrative Medicine and Wellness. That's um, a new project that we hope to get underway soon. We had to put it on hold last year. So as soon as that starts, we'll put your donations toward that. We are also funding, um, this was last year, a genetic testing study. We are two thirds of the way there to enroll patients and we'll report back to you what the results of that study were, was. And then um, we funded our perinatal social work program, which is to support healthy moms and babies. And we had an uptick in clients last year to 102. Um, and this was really um, for basic needs, for obtaining um, supplies for infants and that sort of thing. For this year, um, we are supporting the Pregnancy and Birth Center again. We are helping to purchase infant incubators and hospital grade breastfeeding pillows. Uh, we are investing in technology um, for breast cancer surgery. And this is called a scout radar localization. And it involves um, uh, planting a uh, radar seed within the breast tissue as opposed to a wire, um, which just makes it much more comfortable for patients um, and allows the surgeon um, to you know, remove a tumor or a lymph node more easily. Um, we're also investing in a health equity study in partnership with the local NAACP, this time to focus on Latina women's health. And then finally, we're supporting the perinatal social work program again. So this is what you help to make possible. Um, and our goal is to raise $45,000 this year with your help. Um, so how can you do that? Um, for those of you who are members, um, we invite you to renew. For those of you who um, are thinking about joining, it's $100 or more per year. Um, you're invited to three health talks and you can bring a first time guest with you each time. And 100% of your donation can be earmarked for the project that you are interested in that we've that we're funding for that year. So you just go on our website to learn more, and we hope that you will join us. Um, so I'm going to now introduce our guest speaker, um, Catherine Tierney, um, and she is a board certified family nurse practitioner. Uh, she works in the Middlesex Health Division of Endocrinology, uh, and she is the medical director of the Middlesex Health Gender Medicine and Wellness Program. She is also a lecturer and clinical preceptor at a number of local uh, nursing schools and colleges. And she particularly is in incredibly well known and nationally recognized for her leadership in transgender medicine. And she's going to be talking to us tonight, of course, about gender identity. So you will all certainly learn a lot from her. And one thing, if you have not met her before, um, we know that she is just beloved by her patients in particular and her colleagues as well. So, we invite you to enjoy her talk and welcome Katie. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that very nice introduction. Um, so we're going to talk about gender identity today. Um, I could talk about this for hours, potentially days. So I'll try to stick to my slides and leave lots of time for questions. 
Um, gender is definitely, and what it means has changed so much in the last 20 or even 50 years, and I think it'll change a lot again in the next 20 or 50 years. Um, so I'm going to give you sort of a state of what's going on right now and the programs that we have here at Middlesex to, um, to address gender um, dysphoria and, um, and help people who are transgender and use that sort of as a frame of reference to talk about gender um, in the United States and here um, in our local area. So as Sara said, um, I'm part of the Division of Endocrinology here at Middlesex Health. I see um, primarily patients who are either transgender or have diabetes. Um, those are my specialties, and I am the medical director for our um, Gender Medicine and Wellness Program, which is um, a pretty incredible program, one of it, um, only one of its kind here in the state, and um, there are very few across the country that really do the scope that we are able to do. So um, I'll give you uh, some insights into our program um, and how we use that to, to help our community. So I like to start anytime I'm giving any kind of talk or lecture, I really like to start with, um, with the perspective. So first, I am a cisgender white woman, um, and therefore, um, you know, as much as I know about um, being transgender and transgender medicine, I am not transgender, and so my perspective um, should be noted is not that of, um, of a trans person. Um, I also like to recognize that we are not, uh, that we're on native land. Um, and uh, initially this talk was to be in Killingworth, and so that is primarily Hammonesset um, land, but um, here in uh, Middletown, we're closer to um, Quinnipiac land. So I wanted to, you know, sort of focus on our thoughts about what being a healthy woman is. I think there's lots of, um, sort of changing targets about what it means to be healthy and what it means to be a woman. So we're gonna talk about a couple of things. One is gender identity. What is it? How do you talk about it? What, what do you um, think about it? Um, and then gender transition, how people make that transition, both socially and medically. Um, and then a little bit of my thoughts about gender in 2021 and beyond. Um, and the quote I wanted to start with was, the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And I think that's really, really important to keep in mind as we go through these slides, partly because, um, you know, in the United States, especially in our culture, we are very attached to our stereotypes. Women do some things, men do other things, and that there's not a lot of crossover. Um, and sometimes that's true. Stereotypes often exist because they are very true. But if you stick to only one stereotype, you miss so much of the story about the person that you're interacting with. So we're going to talk a little bit about vocabulary so that um, we're all on the same page about what I'm saying during these slides. The first is that um, these three words are, are used um, somewhat inappropriately, intermittently, um, because we don't do a very good job um, defining them. So sex, gender, and sexual orientation are all three very different things. Sex is what we talk about when uh, we're talking about physical um, genitalia, what somebody was assigned at birth. Um, and that is really has to do with your genetics and your um, and your um, endogenous hormone production. Whereas gender is actually a cultural um, experience. So somebody who lives in the United States and calls themselves or identifies as a woman would um, that's not necessarily based on their sex or their sex assigned at birth. That's a, that's based on their experience of the world. So um, that can mean um, you know a woman could wear pants or wear a dress. Um, somebody could um, have short hair or long hair. Those are all things that sort of um, go along with gender identity and gender expression. Sexual orientation is um, often conflated or, or made to be the same as sex and gender because we um, often think about um, how people interact with other people and then give it a label. So sexual orientation really is about who you have romantic relationships with. It's somewhat... Um, intertwined with your gender identity because I myself identify as female and my romantic partner is also female. So the outside world then labels me as, um, as gay or lesbian. When, um, if my partner, for instance, were to transition to male, then I'm still romantically attracted to the same person, I'm still in the same kind of relationship, but the outside world would then change that label to straight um, or heterosexual. And so um, so that label really is less about your own internal identity and more about your, um, your physical attractions. 
Um, so these things are really important to keep in mind, not only for us to understand, but even as clinicians, sometimes we have to explain it to um, the people we're treating as well, because our culture doesn't do a very good job of, of um, defining them as different. So um, we'll talk a little bit about gender reveal parties a little bit later, but the easiest way to sort of remember this is that um, when we talk about gender reveal parties, those are actually a misnomer. When we do an ultrasound on a baby, we're not talking about what their gender identity is because that doesn't develop until later in life. We're actually talking about the sex of the baby. So that's a sex reveal party, but that's very different, especially if you're going to post it on Instagram. So you'll probably get blocked if you try and do a sex reveal party, but um, I have lots of thoughts and opinions about that in a little while. So some other words that sort of go along with those bigger vocabulary words, the first is the binary. So our culture is very binary in terms of gender, meaning that we expect people to be either male or female. Um, in general, we expect them also to be male or female according to their genitalia. But for a lot of people, that's not actually true. So transgender is sort of an umbrella term that, that encompasses all people who, for whom their sex assigned at birth doesn't necessarily match their gender identity. Non-binary is this idea that they um, that someone either identifies as both genders or neither gender um, and or something other than um, what we have named. Gender non-conforming is the idea that if you identify as or have been assigned a certain gender, such as female, that you don't conform to that according to our culture. This one is difficult for me, partly because, um, you know, if you think about gender identity or gender presentation over time and over cultures, they vary very um, completely. So if you talk about, you know, what was expected of women in the early 1900s or the 1800s versus now, those are very different things. If you talk about even across our country, what's expected in someone who lives in the eastern side of the country versus the Middle West or the Western side, those can even differ in, in the same time frame. And then you talk about different cultures across the world, what's expected of each individual um, gender identity is very different. So this idea that we're, um, that being gender nonconforming is somehow different than regular life, I think is, is um, probably a misnomer. I think everyone is gender nonconforming in some way. Um, if you were to, um, you know, list all the different ways that you can, quote unquote, be a woman, if I, for instance, were to cut my hair, does that make me gender nonconforming? Probably according to the rules of our culture, but maybe not um, changing my identity. So um, one of the best um, sort of ways I've, I've heard spoken about this is um, one of my colleagues in the state who does uh, gender confirming, uh, gender affirming care always talks about, um, she'll put uh, slides up for different pictures and one of them is of a basketball and, and says, you know, what gender is this? And everyone says boy and she always yells at them because in Connecticut, obviously, girls basketball is way better than boys basketball. Um, so, and then gender dysphoria is this idea that that disconnect between your gender identity is, is causing um, some kind of dysphoria or discomfort um, between the identity and your genitals or your sex assigned at birth. Um, I would say that not all trans people are gender dysphoric. Some people are perfectly happy with their dysphoria or with their gender identity and are not dysphoric about it at all. Um, but as I tell people who are in medicine or in health, um, insurance companies rarely pay for awesome. So we always have to call it something wrong. So gender dysphoria is the current term for that. A trans man is someone who is assigned female at birth and is, identifies as male or masculine. And a trans woman is someone who is assigned male at birth and who identifies as um, female or feminine. Um, the last two words I always include because they're words that are used fairly frequently in the community. Passing is the idea that you can go out in the world and be gendered correctly. I think it's really, um, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of a, a double-edged sword, uh, this word, partly because, you know, passing is really a safety issue for a lot of people. Um, I have uh, one patient I saw recently for the first time who came to the visit um, dressed as her authentic self. So she's wearing women's clothing and makeup and long hair. And um, we were talking about her experience and she said, you know, something to the effect of, I was scared to come here dressed like this because I was afraid someone would identify me as a trans woman. And I thought she meant just in general, she meant from the, the distance from her car to my office. Um, so this idea that you can pass and safely go out in the world is really, really important. The reason I have trouble with it is because there should be no reason that our culture requires people to pass in a certain way in order to gain access to certain things like safety. 
So um, I really, um, it bothers me that we expect people to be dressed a certain way or to look a certain way in order um, to maintain just basic safety. Stealth is the um, term we use for people who can um, go out in the world and have um, uh, relationships with people without having to disclose that they are trans. That is a personal choice. Um, I've heard lots of people um, who don't necessarily um, understand um, gender identity very well talk about stealth being um, kind of uh, inauthentic or a lie or not being honest with people. And um, my answer to that is all is that we are all stealth about something. If, if you have, um, say, a mastectomy and then um, breast reconstruction, you don't walk into a room and say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I've had breast reconstruction. That's just thing, something that most people don't need to know. So allowing people who are transgender or have a different um, gender identity than you expect them to have, um, they should be given that, um, that ability to maintain their identity without having to explain it. So a little bit about gender development. So, um, you know, again, in America, we mostly think about gender as being the same as sex assigned at birth. Um, and those things are very different because we all grow up in a different way. So um, sex is actually um, determined by our chromosomes, whether you have an XX, XY, or some other combination of chromosomes. And those um, determine what kind of gonads we're going to um, create, either ovaries or testicles for the most part. And those um, um, gonads are going to then make hormones that lead to our phenotype or how we look on the outside. So for those of us who make um, estrogen, we're going to grow breasts and have softer skin. And um, for people who have testicles and make testosterone, maybe their jaw will be a little bit more um, pronounced or they'll have a deeper voice or be taller. So these things happen. So your brain um, and your physical anatomy actually um, develop at different times. So that's one theory about why some people's gender identity doesn't necessarily match their, um, their sex because their um, brain and how they think about the world has developed at a different time and is exposed to a different environment than that of the uh, development of physical anatomy. So this is one of the places where when I'm trying to explain um, why being transgender is not um, an abnormal thing, we talk about in medicine all the time where, you know, my other big diagnosis that I take care of is diabetes. And most people who come into my office did not choose to be, um, to have diabetes, right? That's just not something you would choose to have. So when somebody comes in for diabetes care, we don't say, well, I just don't understand why you're choosing to do this to yourself. We treat them and we go forward. It's the same way because in people with diabetes, their brain said, don't be diabetic today. And their pancreas is like, meh, I'm not going to make insulin. So people who are transgender, their brain says, I'm a boy, and their body was like, mm, I think I'm going to make ovaries today. So it's the same exact way, but in our culture, we reverse that. We say, however your body developed was completely correct, and you should follow it at all times, even though your brain says something different. So around age two, people um, start to have um, a gender identity. Around age two, people, um, kids are pretty clear on what their gender is or starting to develop that. Um, and so people will say, well, how can a two-year-old even know their gender? And the answer to that is that um, for the bulk of kids who are not trans, we don't question their gendered identity at all. So if we have a sex assigned at birth female child and that person wants to wear dresses, we don't question it at all. But if that person was born, assigned male at birth and has a penis and wants to wear a dress, we question it all the time. So. Um, that's just a way of saying, you know, however a child develops that gender identity is completely normal. The other time that um, gender identity development um, is pretty serious is around the time of adolescence and puberty, because all those changes are starting to happen. So there's a lot of, um, of change in how, how kids experience their gender as they go forward, but once they hit puberty, whatever gender identity um, is there is pretty likely to persist into adulthood. Um, and so puberty can be a really hard time for trans kids because that their bodies are essentially betraying them. That's the point at which their bodies are really developing in a way that's not normal to their um, expectations. And then even into adulthood, we have many, many patients who are transitioning late in life, sometimes in their 70s and 80s, because they've had this um, gender identity their whole lives, but it's never been safe or possible for them to transition. And so even into adulthood, people are really getting a chance to learn the vocabulary and experience their lives and bodies in different ways. Um, and so, you know, part of the things that are very exciting about my job is getting to see people really be their authentic selves. And this has a lot to do with that. 
So identity expression, these are things that are pretty um, common. Everybody does them. We just don't necessarily realize that we're doing them. So whether you wear um, your clothes a certain way or certain clothes, hair, activities, um, those are all ways to sort of show the world what your gender identity is. And this is this has to do with how you're most comfortable and how you um, derive comfort from the expectations of others. So, um, you know, how I dress is often related to um, what's appropriate for work and what feels most comfortable to me. Um, and that is um, part of my gender expression. And then really important to understand that gender diversity or this idea that people are going to experience their gender different ways does not equal equal pathology. A lot of us have some things in one gender and then we experience some things in another gender. And as in our culture, as long as you pretty much stay in the box you were told to stay in, then everybody's happy. But the more times you come out of that box and go into the other, um, or worse in our culture, into a gray area where you're not either, um, then people start to get worried about it. But this is not pathologic. This is not wrong. This is something that has been true across um, many, many um, decades um, of our history and also across species. Um, the binary, you know, is, is if you think back to that initial quote about stereotypes, the binary is very important to our culture because it gives us a lot of sort of grounding ideas about what a person is going to be like. So if there's only two choices, male or female, then you immediately know that you can expect X, Y, and Z from this person. So that binary is very central to, um, to how we think about people. Um, but it really does affect our expectations because if you if you lay out a set of expectations for somebody, um, especially you know we're doing ultrasounds um, when someone's pregnant and we're saying you're going to have a girl, what you're saying is you're going to have a baby with a vagina, not necessarily a girl. But it gives you that sort of you know as a parent, I am completely aware of wanting to know every answer for everything that my children are ever going to do, um, and that first designation as girl or boy is a way to set them on a path. And if we expect them to stay on that path, um, then we're likely to be disappointed. So gender is pervasive in our culture. Our toys, bathrooms, party favors. Um, I distinctly remember going to a party with my kids when they were little and there were girls and boys at the party and there were girl favors and boy favors. And the person there was so sorry to me because only the girl favors were left for my kids and both my kids identify as, as boys. And honestly, my kids were just excited because there was a candy bar inside. It had nothing to do with what color the party favor was or anything like that. And there was no apology needed. Um, toys are completely gendered in the United States. Um, I have a great um, slide that shows, you know, if the toy is meant to be used with your genitals, then it's not appropriate for children. Otherwise, it's a toy. If your kid likes it, play with it. Um, at some point, Target decided that they were going to stop um, making boy and girl toy aisles and people lost their mind as if they would not know which toy their, ba their baby or child would like to play with because it wasn't in the right aisle. In schools, it's um, very clear, you know, the first thing the teacher says, good morning, boys and girls. So any kid who doesn't identify as a boy or girl or identifies as um, something other than they were assigned automatically knows that they need to choose in order to be accepted. Um, another example, um, when my kids were little, um, I think in third grade, my older son, um, there were book recommendations on the, um, you know, at the entrance of his classroom, and there was a blue page and a pink page. So the blue page was clearly meant for boys, and it had all the books about sports, and on the girl page, there was lots of books about princesses. So a couple of things happened there. One is that if my kid is interested in stories about princesses, he's going to know that he's not supposed to read them. Um, and if a kid is not identifying, uh, you know, is, is identified by the teacher as a girl but wants to read off the blue page, that kid is going to know that there's um, a problem there. So a couple of um, just sort of thoughts about, you know, I think about gender day in and day out. Um, so these are things that you would say to a kid. What a good climber you are. That's such a pretty shirt. You're adorable. Look at those muscles. And I think you could guess which, um, you know, whether I'm talking to a boy or a girl when you say those things. Um, so other ways to say things to kids that are not gendered and make it much more clear that they're just human is, I saw how kind you were to your friends, or I love your laugh, I'm very proud of you, or that took a lot of courage. Those are really easy ways to support kids without having to um, base it in their gender. Um, things that sometimes kids and adults say, why does she want to play with the boys, or boys don't play in the kitchen, or why does he always dress like a girl, or you throw it like a girl? And these are some of the answers that I would change those to. 
The first is kids enjoy lots of different activities and not have it be a gendered based thing. Um, everyone can learn recipes and help clean up and that clothes are clothes and whatever is comfortable is what you should wear. And the last one I always include because you thrill like a girl is often seen as something bad to say to someone. But in fact, I know quite a lot of girls who throw really hard or also throw really um, slow and can strike you out. So um, throwing like a girl is not a bad thing. So a little data about trans people um, in the United States. In 2016, this study came out from the National Center for Trans Equality. Um, and it was a repeat of, of a study done about um, four or five years um, earlier. Um, the first study in 2011 actually only had about 750 respondents. And in, only in that five year time, um, our culture improved so much for the comfort of trans people that tw almost 28,000 people answered that survey. Historically, it's been very difficult to get good data on trans people because um, convincing them that we have their best interest at heart um, is really hard because historically the med medical establishment has not treated um, trans people that well. So in that study, they asked lots and lots of questions. It's an extensive study asking about their experience in the United States. And 40% of those people um, reported attempting suicide at some point in their lifetime. Um, the national average for both completion and suicide attempt um, for non-transgender people is actually 1.6%. So in this one very small, um, you know, very small pop population inside the United States, there's a very high suicide rate. Um, and the thing I like to talk about with that is that this number is not because there's something inherently wrong with being transgender, it's that in our culture, we are not very tolerant. And so when that happens, people feel like not their authentic self. If you feel like a boy and everybody around you consistently tells you that you're a girl, you start to think that you're not a real human being or you don't have, um, you don't have uh, worth to that person. And unfortunately, that happens a lot with um, families and teachers and, um, and workplaces. 33% of the people in that study reported having at least one negative interaction with a healthcare provider. 23% just did not seek healthcare that they needed because of that. 46% were verbally harassed in the year before and 47%, almost 50% of the population had been sexually assaulted. And I, you know, there's no good, we don't really know the reason why that's happening. I, my guess is because um, in our culture, we feel like we have some kind of ownership over other people's gender identity and other people's genitals. Um, and so um, the rate of attempted suicide actually increases into the 60% range um, in people who have been um, previously sexually assaulted. And this is really important in medicine because we do a lot of invasive procedures to people. And when we're doing that, we need to keep in mind that, that was, this one po population has um, experienced a lot of trauma. Bathrooms are a really, um, you know, touchy subject for a lot of people. Um, in Connecticut, we're very lucky that we have laws that protect people who um, are transgender. So it is the law in Connecticut that you use the bathroom that um, uh, correlates with your gender identity, regardless of your genitals. Um, but in this survey, they talked 57% um, uh, of people did not feel asking, feel comfortable asking the police for help. And 59% avoided using a public restroom because they were afraid they were going to be um, injured in that process of going to the bathroom. Um, and I like to say, you know, I think the world would be very different with bathrooms if we peed, say, out of our wrist or a finger it, rather than genitals. But because it's our genitals, we have a lot of ideas about where people should go to the bathroom. Um, I'll never forget when my kids were little needing to use a bathroom and they're not being a line uh, um, for the girls' bathroom, but they're being a line for the boys' bathroom. People looking at me like I was crazy because my three-year-old who was either going to pee on the floor or in that girl's toilet didn't seem to matter um, if they um, were gonna make a mess or not. That seemed crazy to people that I would take them in that bathroom. Um, in healthcare, 19% um, of the people um, who responded to this survey uh, were refused care outright. Um, this is really important because if you are refused care, you don't go back. And so there, the health of this community is, is at stake in that, um, in that way. 28% for, were verbally harassed in a medical setting, um, and 50% had to teach their medical provider. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, with any other diagnosis, we do not pretend, we do not act like we don't know the answer. We will look up that answer on Google or up to date before we will ever admit that we don't know that answer. But for some reason in this one particular diagnosis, um, the provider feels free just to say to patients that they don't know what they're doing and to, does the patient wanna tell them what to do, which is inappropriate. Um, at Middlesex, we have um, um, been working very hard over the last five or six years to build um, the gender medicine and wellness program. Um, we are recognized by the Human Rights Campaign as a um, LGBTQ healthcare equality leader and have for the last six years. 
um, with the help of many, many, many people across this, um, this institution. Um, you know, as the medical director of the program, I often get the, um, the, uh, the compliments, but honestly, the work comes from everybody across the health system. Um, I have not once had to convince somebody to do the care. Everyone has raised their hand and said that they are willing to do it. So across Middlesex Health, we have um, clinicians in almost every department who are um, competent or um, experts in trans care and family mm -hmm. medicine and primary care, OBGYN, urology, plastic surgery, of course, in endocrinology, infectious disease, behavioral health, PTOT speech, and nursing. We have um, incredible um, clinicians at every level um, doing amazing work. Um, we're dedicated to being involved in the community. So um, I present uh, both locally and nationally. Um, we run support groups that are free to the community and patients do not need to be patients of the health system in order to access those support groups. And those have been absolutely critical during the time of COVID um, because of the isolation. We are um, supporters of CT Voice and Middletown Pride. Um, we've been lucky enough to go on TV and not my strong suit, but super fun anyway. Um, and we had a, um, uh, before COVID um, made us uh, go, put most things online, we were able to do a day of gifts. GIFT stands for um, Gathering Information for Trans Services. Um, and our um, lead in pelvic uh, physical therapy, Lisa Gramlich, um, put together this amazing day, which was essentially a health fair for trans people and brought in a nationally known surgeon, uh, Dr. Christine McGinn, to talk to um, the community and to us. Um, and we uh, most recently have um, put on a, um, a webinar for the COVID vaccine information specifically for the LGBTQ community. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information about transitioning itself. Um, certainly, um, this is a topic that I could talk about for hours and hours. So in general, um, transitioning really is either um, social or medical or both. Um, so in terms of hormones, we're talking about masculinizing hormones, so that, that's typically testosterone. We do everything from microdosing to full replacement dosing, um, and then helping people find whatever um, surgical procedures are right for them. Um, not all trans people are interested in surgical procedures, whether it's because it's a surgery that nobody wants to have or because they don't have access or because they're perfectly happy in their body and, and hormonal transition is enough for them. In feminizing hormone therapy, we primarily focus on estrogen, but we also use medications that block testosterone. Um, not everybody needs to block testosterone. Some um, uh, female identified people will do both estrogen and testosterone um, that they endogenously make. Um, and then for surgical procedures, again, not everybody chooses to have surgery. Not a, there's no, you know, sort of complete um, quote unquote transition. This is always a process for lots of people and people change their minds and at different times about what's appropriate for them. Um, I think the most important part of this kind of care is really meeting the patient where they are and not letting them fall into the binary. So if you identify as feminine or female, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean you need to do a certain number of things in order to attain that status. If your identity is female, it's female and we move on from there. So um, just I wanted to highlight a couple of really special things that are in our program. Um, so the support groups are really, really important. Um, we have a support group for allies and family. We have a support group for feminine identified people, masculine identified people, and non-binary. Um, in um, gender affirming procedures, we're really lucky to have Dr. John Borkowski who does um, chest surgery for us, both mastectomies and um, breast augmentation. And we also have um, Dr. Segrist doing um, orthiectomies for us, which is really, really important to a lot of trans people. Um, in PTOT and speech, we have some really innovative programs going on. First, in pelvic physical therapy, um, we are really lucky to have um, uh, most of our uh, pelvic physical therapists are trained in um, post-vaginoplasty care, which is a surgery that some trans feminine people have. Um, and they've been able to help both trans masculine and feminine people with um, urinary continence and pelvic health, um, which has been just absolutely incredible. If you're a trans person and you really have a lot of dysphoria about your genitals or you've been traumatized in that area, it's really special to have a group of people who can make sure that that, that part of you is healthy. Um, in our um, occupational therapy department, um, Janine Stoner is doing um, binding teaching and measuring so that um, people who are binding their breasts can get um, the right size binder. Um, and she's actually currently running a study on, um, on binding and how it affects pulmonary function, uh, which is a really innovative, there's no research out there about what's safe um, and what um, kind of damage can be done from inappropriate binding. So um, 
her doing that study is really, really important. And then our, um, our speech therapists are trained in both feminizing and masculinizing um, uh, voice therapy, which is really um, a safety issue for a lot of people and one that can cause a lot of dysphoria if their voice is not where they think it should be. Um, and then the last piece um, that recently just happened is we're um, going to be starting opening to adolescent patients. Um, we have a, um, another family nurse practitioner who is experienced in um, adolescent trans care, um, Britta Shoot, who will be starting with us in just a couple of weeks. So just a couple of thoughts about gender in 2021. Um, you know, I think we've sometimes lost sight of what it means to be healthy and happy. I think that, um, I think a lot about what being healthy means. I treat um, people with lots of, um, of uh, health issues, including diabetes and um, um, gender identity. Um, and I feel like we, we start chasing medical targets for, um, for reasons that we don't always understand. So if we're chasing an A1C or a certain hormone level, we have to take a step back and make sure that we're chasing it for the right reasons and that it's really adding to our health and not subtracting. Um, you know, avoiding illness as humans is just an, an, a fight that we're always going to lose. We are organic beings and we are, you know, as entropy would have it, we are always on the way down. So fig figuring out what kind of illness and how to manage it um, and not just running in the other direction, I think is really important to being healthy. And then thinking about ways that we want to have a good death. We are all marching towards that at some point and making sure that we keep that in, um, in the sights of how we want to live in order to have a good death. And then being happy instead of maybe um, meeting all these medical targets that we've said that is good for the population, maybe we need to start talking about being at peace in our bodies and our minds and, and having that be the priority rather than um, certain numbers. So a couple of things I think a lot about. One is gender reveal parties. Again, you know, gender reveal parties are a complete misnomer. These are not, um, when you're doing an ultrasound, what you're what you're showing someone is uh, a baby's sex, not their gender. Gender has to be experienced in our culture. And so, you know, the in endocrine, we're pretty dorky. So we have lots of really dorky jokes. And one of the jokes is if someone says, oh, you have kids, do you have boys or girls? And I say, I don't know, they haven't told me yet. Um, because it's really important to let kids experience um, what they need to in order to come to that identity. And that doesn't mean you have to leave, people, leave kids genderless for their whole lives. It just means that if they're experiencing an identity that's not what you expected, that you let them explore that. Um, you know, the um, gender reveal parties were actually started by somebody um, several years ago who um, ended up as that child um, became older, actually was a trans kid. So their gender reveal party was um, not correct. Um, and um, gender reveal parties, I always sort of joke that they're destroying the world because some of them, people literally set off smoke bombs and set wildfires. There's one literally in court right now because of that. Um, but really what I want to say is, um, you know, we, we expect a lot of things out of our children and, our, um, and the kids in our community, and maybe one of those could not be to hold true to some pre-existing idea of what it means to be a girl or a boy. And then gender and food. Um, uh, Emily Meller is the other APRN in, in my office, and we have a lot of deep conversations about um, food because we both treat um, diabetes and we both treat um, transgender people and food and weight and the way that I, we see our bodies is really, really central to what we do. Um, I feel um, very strongly that um, this idea that people need to hit a goal weight or um, eat a certain number of, um, you know, a certain kind of food in order to be um, worthy or healthy is really, really difficult. So Mark Bittman is a, a cookbook author um, and, um, and he writes about food a lot. And so at the beginning of this year in the New York Times, he wrote an op-ed. Um, and the thing that really, really struck me was that when we talk about food and weight, we don't talk about gender and the expectations that only some genders um, meet a certain target. Um, but we also don't talk about um, how much food costs in this country and what we, what the lobbyists and what our, um, our um, big um, companies have done to our diet in terms of what is, um, what we're told to eat and when. Um, 30 or 40 years ago, we decided that uh, fat was the enemy. And so if you ate fat, it was a bad thing. And so we drove people to eat um, essentially only carbohydrates. And what ha ended up happening was that people were getting very sick with increased heart disease, not less. 
Um, so we are paying attention to markers that don't necessarily um, mean that we're going to be healthy. So I really want to change the conversation. I talk about this with patients a lot. Um, a lot of my patients have been in the medical system for a long time. We typically don't get referred um, patients who have had um, new diagnosis of diabetes. Most of them have had it for a long time. Um, and so people have been trained that they should be at war with their food and that they should trust their bodies. Um, and so it's really important, especially in women's bodies, the, the um, images that we see and the uh, messages that were sent by our media and our medical system um, is very, very difficult and doesn't necessarily lead to better health. So um, one thing um, I really um, try to change the language about is are these couple of things. So one is when people say, well, I had a cheat day or I cheated or I ate something that I wasn't supposed to. So what if instead of saying um, I had a cheat day, what if we say I chose to eat food? That's a very different statement. Um, everyone is going to eat food that isn't necessarily um, helpful for the, either their disease process or their weight or their health, but sometimes it just tastes good. And sometimes it's just part of our culture. I always tell Emily and I always joke that when we're um, dying, if they don't give me my chocolate cake, I will be an angry person. There is um, no reason that we can't eat foods that we love as long as we do it in moderation. And it's not helpful if we eat the food and then decide that it was a bad thing. That's not a good um, thing to carry. Another thing is I work out so I can eat. Um, and what if instead we said, I exercise because I'm strong or I want to be strong because we exercise because it's good for our bodies. Absolutely, it can have an effect on your weight or your body size, but really exercise is something that's good for your mind, your sleep and your health. So let's exercise because we're strong, not because we have to. Um, and um, instead of talking about good and bad food, maybe we should just say that food is nutritious and important to my health. We always sort of joke that um, people say, well, I'm just gonna cut out carbs. I'm like, well, there are three main macronutrients in our diet and carbs is one of them. So if you're gonna cut out a third of your food, maybe that's not the most, um, the fastest way to good health. And the most important thing I think is confidence is a skill, not a trait. So confidence in exercise or food choices Confidence in anything you do. This is not something you're born with. Nobody's born confident. Maybe there's a couple people, but for the most part, most of us are not born with this trait. This is something we have to practice and get good at. So I, you know, my confidence now compared to when I was a teenager or even when I was in my 20s and 30s is very different, um, partly because I just don't care anymore, but part be, partly because I practiced that confidence over and over again. And sometimes you literally just have to fake it till you make it. So my last thoughts about um, gender, one is that we just have to depathologize it. There's nothing wrong with your gender, no matter what it is. If you were the girliest girl girl you've ever met, good for you. If you're the boyest girl girl you've ever met, then great for you. People experience their gender through lots of different ways, through cultural and social interaction, through their body and physical appearance. But the most important thing is that we treat the human in front of us. Someone else's gender identity has absolutely no bearing on my gender identity. So it should never make you mad or upset when you misgender somebody or they have a different gender than you expect them to have. Experience, let them experience their bodies the way they want to and you experience yours. So always paying attention using their preferred name and preferred pronoun. And if you don't know, you should ask. Um, and in medicine, we always make sure that we're treating the person's organs, not the, um, what we expect them to have. So a couple of um, just quotes that I had from a trans feminine person um, that I follow who's a public figure. Um, one is that their fear is not your own. Emancipate yourself from their shame, protect your beauty. It's really important to be authentic and to protect your own beauty regardless of what other people think is right for you. And then just the last couple of things I wanted to say. Um, the survey also showed, it showed some pretty serious things going on in the trans community, but it really showed that family acceptance was really, really a positive indicator for people being more healthy. So people experienced significantly less homelessness, were less likely to be incarcerated, um, less likely to have suicidal ideation, um, and less likely to have um, alcohol or drug use um, with family acceptance. These are all really important things, and I think it really just points to the fact that if we're loved, um, we have a better chance um, at fewer destructive behaviors and a better um, chance of health. So being transgender is not, or gender diverse is not a disease. When and how someone trans, um, transitions is really up to that person, not up to the rest of us. There's no such thing as binary. There's male and female, but lots of things in between and all around. 
Um, I really encourage everyone, you and all the people around you to come as you are, whatever you're most comfortable in or saying is, is should be what you do. Um, in medicine, it takes a team of people to make sure that we're doing right by our trans patients. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, all of us are an expert in compassion. There's literally no reason we can't co be compassionate, even for things we don't understand. And I always finish on this slide um, because um, definitely my comfort zone. I am definitely an anxious person, and I don't love being out of my comfort zone. But I 100% always found that once I step out of my comfort zone and really start asking questions and get more information, that's where the magic happens. So we'll take some questions. All right. Um, Catherine, can you hear me? I can. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much uh, for such an informative uh, presentation. I do have two questions that have come in. Um, the questions go back to uh, your slide on, <clears throat> excuse me, the transgender survey and the negative interactions with healthcare providers and not feeling safe. And the question is, are, are doctors being trained differently now to work with um, transgender patients? And then also, if you know, is law enforcement going through training as well? So um, the last set of data that I saw on medical and nursing education um, was from several years ago, but at that point, um, only 19% of medical and nursing schools included transgender care as part of their regular um, curriculum. So it's definitely improved. It's probably not as high as 50% at this point, but one of the biggest problems with, um, with medical providers is that a lot of them have not received any kind of training. So that's one of the things that we try to do in our program. Um, is um, make sure that we are um, educating all the providers around us and continuing to educate because things change over time um, because we, none of us, I certainly did not receive any kind of education in that, um, in that realm. So a lot of that is student directed. A lot of students in these programs will um, bring in speakers from other places um, and hopefully as time goes on, more and more of these curriculums will include it. Um, for um, law enforcement, it really is up to each individual um, department. Um, there are lots of departments um, across the country, uh, very big departments that are doing a lot of training in this area to make sure that um, police officers are um, comfortable and, um, and know what they're doing and know the resources. Um, and in Connecticut, we, we have a lot of laws protecting trans people, which is very, very helpful. Um, and a lot of these, um, a lot of law enforcement um, departments are doing very well with that. Um, certainly, there's always room to grow, um, and especially in, in a department um, such as medicine or law, law enforcement, when off, often we're seeing patients at their um, most difficult, um, that um, we do the training over and over again. Great question. Great. Thank you. Another question that came in was, can you speak a little bit about transgender kids in sports? <laughs> always a fun topic. Um, so, you know, I have... Um, uh, in the state of Connecticut, we have um, a law that um, uh, the CIAC, which is the governing body for sports in, Connecticut, in high school sports for Connecticut, um, has a uh, rule that um, you participate in the sport that correlates with your gender identity. They do have laws, that, you know, not laws, but um, the recommendation is you um, can only identify as one gender per year. Um, you know, for um, most of these kids, you know, sports are so important to kids. Um, they are often the only place that kids fit in or have any kind of success. Um, and to marginalize only trans kid who, kids who are the um, minority um, in these sports is really, really, really harmful. Um, and um, ultimately, I think you got to think about, you know, what it means to win, right? If we are only um, only focused on a certain score or a certain team um, and winning then I think, or opportunities for you know, one kid and not another, then I think, um, I think we're missing the boat. I think the point is to include all kids and teach them how to, um, to relate to one another. Um, there's um, a lot of complicated questions that go along with that. I think it is more about fear than anything um, and, um, my um, absolute stance is that trans kids should be able to participate in sports with their that correlate with their gender identity all of the time. Okay, our next question is, are teachers also being trained to understand these ideas in our schools? 
Absolutely. Many of the schools have, um, you know, they all have professional development. And so um, a lot of us who do this kind of education across the state um, go in and do those trainings to help teachers um, further understand what these kids are going through. Um, and um, luckily, we have incredible resources and so many teachers who are just supporting kids for who they are um, and not who we expect them to be and um, are really a lifeline for a lot of these kids. Thank you. Uh, we're getting a few more questions in as uh, we continue. A question that just recently came in is, when you're treating patients, do you treat transgender patients as their birth or their trans status? So it depends on what you mean by treat. So when, um, when we meet patients, we always ask them what their um, preferred gender pronouns are and what their preferred name is. And so if I'm treating somebody in the sense of how I um, talk to them, it is always what they have chosen. Um, and I tell patients all the time, they can wear whatever they want and change their name a hundred times or their pronoun. It can flip flop back and forth. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever fits them that day is what we're going to use that day. Um, and so when we're, um, you know, doing hormone therapy, we're going to whatever um, hormone makes sense for that patient at that time. Um, and then there are lots of things in medicine that are gendered in terms of, say, breast cancer or testicular cancer or something like that. Um, and so we have to pay attention to the organs that are there, but we're also doing that in a gender affirming way. So um, again, we treat the patient um, that's in front of us, not necessarily treating their gender or their sex. So we're looking at the person and their physical form as well as their identity, and then we're going from there. Thank you. And our last question so far um, is, do the negative outcomes that were noted in the survey decrease as someone becomes comfortable over time with his or her trans identity? Absolutely. So we actually, the data in that study, um, which is available free online, if anybody's interested in reading the full study, um, the data um, when someone, especially say in employment, once they are out and um, uh, presenting as their authentic identity, their experience improves quite a lot. Um, and it doesn't seem to have, you know, it seems to be a better experience when someone's authentic than when they're having to hide somebody, something. Um, and I really do see in patients over and over and over again where the more um, they are um, allowed to present as their authentic selves, and someone, sometimes that's just being able to say it out loud, and sometimes that's presenting full time, um, it really does make a difference in their sense of well being. Um, and I think all of us can um, relate to that in the, in the sense that um, we all want to be seen for who we are. And that's no different for somebody who's trans. It's just more of a touch point because in our culture, um, talking about gender and, and thinking about that is really, really, um, people have a lot of opinions. Okay, uh, another question. How do you think that a better understanding of gender identity is good for everyone, not just transgender people? Love the question. Clearly someone who's thinking about gender identity. Um, but really, you know, I think it, I, it has opened my world so much. I've been doing this kind of care for almost 20 years and it has opened my eyes so much to, you know, how we experience gender, um, which is universal across the board. This is not something that is um, that is unique to only trans people. All of us experience gender every day, all day. And if you don't stop and think about it, you don't necessarily realize it. Um, but being able to experience our own um, gender identity, no matter what that is, um, only can lead to being your authentic self. And ultimately, I think that's the goal for everybody. And if you go back to my slide about what I think makes a happy person, if that's being at peace in your, in your body, um, then that is directly related to that. Okay, another question is, you hear young people say quite a bit that they are confused. Does media attribute to this and do kids change? So I think all of us change all the time. That's not something that's abnormal. I think this idea that we have one identity and we're gonna stick with it for the rest of their, our lives is really um, not a true statement. Um, one of the things I saw recently was that we're going to have different identities throughout our lives and all of them are authentic and all of them are needed. Um, you know, and I think if kids are confused, it's probably that there are people around them not supporting them. Um, most kids um, are, I think, allowed to be confused. The world is confusing. Um, and being giving someone the space to explore that and say, well, let's try different things. You know, 
um, I was a basketball player growing up. And if somebody, um, when I was in high school, had given me a lacrosse stick, I would have looked at, the, looked at them like they had three heads. Um, but then when I got to college, I was like, oh, this is actually kind of fun and I can play this game and it's more familiar to me than I actually realized it was. So that can be true for all kinds of different things. So if um, kids are confused, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's an opportunity to explore different identities, try them on and decide if they fit. The more times we give people a safe place to try those identities out and figure that out, the more happy that person's going to be. Maybe they'll decide that's not part of their identity, but maybe they will, or maybe later in life that will come back and be something that they think about. Um, I think giving people that opportunity is really, really important. Great, thank you. And another question, and this is a little bit more uh, general. Can you speak a little bit more about older people who to decide to transition later in life? So everybody, you know, deciding to transition is a very personal and um, a very personal decision. And so I have a lot of patients who knew that they were, um, you know, their gender identity was different than their sex assigned at birth long ago. But if they are now in their 70s and 80s, that was in the, you know, 40s, 50s and 60s and at a time when there was no medical care available um, and it wasn't culturally accepted. And so we have a lot of patients who are waiting to retire or waiting for a parent to die or a spouse um, to move on so that they can feel comfortable doing their transition. And so, um, you know, we have patients who come in who are just for the first time in their 70s and 80s, getting able, being able to say the words and to explore the options that they have. And sometimes those are medical and sometimes they're not. Um, but just being able to be themselves and have someone um, recognize them for their um, authentic identity is really, um, it's really, you know, brings a tear to my eye, mostly because they've lived a long life without being able to do that. Um, but being able to offer that is really, really um, one of my favorite things in, our, in my job. Thank you. That was the last question that we had. Okay. Thank you so much for everyone. Um, I'm going to let Sarah um, come back on and finish up. Um, if anyone comes up with other questions and wants to send them in, Sarah can certainly get them to me. Um, I am always available and, as you can probably tell, love talking about gender identity all the time. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's so exciting to have you online. I wish I could see your faces. Um, so just to wrap up, I want to remind you of our next event, and this will be indoors, knock on wood. Um, it's We had to change the date from the date that we publicized earlier in the year. So it's Wednesday, October 20th. And the topic is gut check, what women need to know about the, their digestive health. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Nadeem Hussain, who is a gastroenterologist with us. Um, and this will be at Camp Hazen. So stay tuned for emails and postcards about that so you can register. Um, we do want your feedback. Um, and Sally's going to put a link in the chat to our survey. Uh, but it's middlesexhealth.org slash women's fund survey. We'd love to get your feedback about tonight and about future programming. Um, and then finally, um, just a reminder that we invite you to become a member if you're not already. Uh, certainly renew your membership and you'll be getting something in the mail from us to let you know if you're due. Um, and just to learn more about the Women's Fund, you can go to our website, middlesexhealth.org slash women's wellness fund. Um, my name is Sarah Moore and I'm the Director of Development. This is my phone number and email address. Um, if you're looking to find um, more about our gender medicine and wellness program, you can go to the Middlesex Health website and find it that way. Um, and there's a lot of information and it lists all the providers um, who provide the care that Katie mentioned. So thank you again so much for joining us this evening and to seeing each other in October. Um, we can't wait. So thank you so much and have a great night.